Uh, so we're going to talk about security. How many people hate security? It's okay. You can be honest. Raise your hand if you want. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's like office space, right? I mean, the guy's coming down the hall. It's security. And you're like, oh, crap. What's this guy doing? What's he going to tell us we need to do today? This is a problem we have, right? There's a, there, there's a huge discrepancy of security for people. And uh, I'm hopefully going to help break down some of that. Because some of the stuff I'm going to show you today will hopefully show you how easy some of the stuff that we do is. Um, and one of the reasons I want to share it with developers is all the stuff that I'm going to show you, me, the AppSec guy, I can't fix. Right? I can't go into your code. I'm not going to go into your code and fix anything. Um, I spent a long time as a developer. And I know how risky it is to touch any line of code. Maybe your code's better. I mean, I worked on an application back in like 2000. They had JavaScript that was eight pages worth of JavaScript, like eight like steps on the screen of JavaScript. And you fix step one, you broke step six. All right, so I don't, I'm not touching people's code. That's not my problem. I don't troubleshoot that stuff anymore. All right, I test it. But all this stuff you guys can do to help protect your application. So we're going to walk through this and talk about some of these things. And we're going to talk about a couple different examples. We're going to walk through a couple demos um, of really what I want to show you is not necessarily the hacking side of, hey, this is how we hack the system. But I kind of want to see you to see a little bit of that. So that way you get an understanding of how quickly we can take advantage of a flaw. So one of the things we're going to talk about, SQL injection. Who here has heard of SQL injection? Good. It's only been around for 25 years. I'd hope almost everybody has. Um, anybody think that we don't write apps anymore with SQL injection in them? Because I'll tell you, I just started with a new client. And uh, two nights ago, the first day we started testing, they had SQL injection. And I'm going to show you the tool I use to take advantage of SQL injection. So you get a good understanding of why it's bad to have SQL injection. So hopefully, that demo will work. I'm hoping. I'm hoping. Uh, we're going to talk about cross-site scripting. Anybody heard of cross-site scripting? Everybody feel comfortable with cross-site scripting? You know how to fix it. You know how to, you don't have to know how to hack it, but you know how, to, you know how it works. You feel comfortable. If I came to you and said, hey, you got a cross-site scripting flaw on this page, you'd be good fixing it, right? No. No. <laughs> All right, well, hopefully at the end of this, I'm not going to get language specific. Don't hate me. My, my demo app is PHP, uh, just because it's easy to put on any platform. Um, you know, and I stopped developing ASP.NET a long time ago. Um, so, you know, I was a web forms guy. Don't hate me for that either. But MVC. Uh, I like web forms. So I do it in PHP, but the concepts are the same uh, as we walk through that stuff. So just a little bit about me. If you haven't met me before, my name is James Jardine, uh, CEO of Jardine Software. I don't do software anymore, but I've had the company since 2004, so I've kept the name. But I also do a DBA as DevelopSec because everybody thinks I do software. <laughs> so I had to come up with something that was more security based. Uh, I hate stuff with sec in the name too, but I had to do it. I've uh, been doing IT for a long time, doing a lot of different things. Uh, I taught for SANS. I don't know if anybody's heard of SANS in here, but if you do anything security wise, they do all the major security training. Um, so they're a pretty big deal. I taught for them secure coding and .NET course, help write their course. It's a four day course, it's a long time. Um, and pretty expensive. Uh, I've taught other courses. I spent a lot of time doing pen testing. Um, so the offensive side of things, I actually did offensive for everything. So I still have my FedEx. I should start wearing that during my presentations. But I still have my FedEx shirt for when I do physical penetration testing. Um, so when I'm trying to get into your building or something like that, I dress up as a FedEx. I get you know, bring a little box and see if the receptionist will let me through. Um, and did all that stuff. But at heart, I'm an AppSec person. Uh, because I come from development. So I wanted to get out of that stuff, and now all I do is focus on application security. Uh, you know, one of my biggest sections over here, blogging and podcasting. I do two different podcasts. I do a YouTube channel now as well, uh, which is starting back up now that school's out, because when everybody's home, that's hard to do. Uh, but my office, I, have, I sit with a big, huge green screen behind me. Um, it's good times. Uh, but I do a lot of podcasting, um, blogging, talking about security-related topics. So why do we want to talk about security? Obviously, we see breaches every day, right? I mean, anybody read the news? I mean, I see them all the time. Breaches are everywhere. Everybody's losing credentials. They're losing credit card numbers. They're losing all this stuff, right? So obviously, it's important. We even got people, want to <laughs> choose my words here, saying that they're having their addresses breached and stuff like that. I know growing up, they used to throw everybody in town's address on my front door every year. Now, apparently, that's a breach. 
Um, but we have to protect this data. And I talk to people, you know, when I talk about sensitive data and that, there's different ways we classify data. There is legally sensitive data, right? We have data breach notification laws, so if certain types of data gets breached, we have to notify the state attorney, we have to send out notification letters, this is the reason why banks tell you that your account's been breached, because it's legally required. Things like your address are not on that list, um, but obviously still show up in the news because people get upset. If I give you something to hold and you let somebody else take it, we don't like that. Now, I'm pretty torn on the subject because, you know, I'm not the type that thinks that, you know, if I leave my front door unlocked, that it's okay for somebody to come in and take my stuff just because I left my front door unlocked. <laughs> it's still my house. You're not supposed to come in, but that's for a different day. Uh, but we need to make sure we protect this. We need to make sure we protect critical infrastructure, right? We've got, everything's IoT these days. You know, everybody, I just heard somebody sitting at lunch talking about dishwashers can't be bought without Wi-Fi connections. I don't know. I run a lot of IoT stuff in my house. My dishwasher, not. Uh, my refrigerator is not connected, my toaster is not connected, but I have every Google device known to man except for the phone uh, because I'm a security guy, I use iPhones. Uh, <laughs> I don't use Android, it's malware laden. Uh, but I got everything else, right? The Google Home, I got uh, the doorbell, I've got the lock on the door, I've got the smoke detector, my whole house is wired with all that stuff. I don't really have a huge concern about people taking my stuff or you know, being able to hack into my thermostat. Uh, the only time they've ever shown hacking a thermostat was at DEF CON, uh, and they actually plugged a USB cable into it. So as I tell everybody, if you break into my house and hack my thermostat, and don't walk four feet further into my office and take that stuff, I'm probably not too concerned about you hacking my thermostat, because you don't have a whole lot going on upstairs. Uh, but when we talk about breaches, this is just a small snippet. So a lot of states have notification laws. Every state has a breach notification law, which says if certain types of data get stolen, you have to let us know and you have to send out notifications to your users. Well, this here is a sample of New Hampshire's, or no, they made this Massachusetts. Uh, no, New Hampshire, yeah. Sample of New Hampshire's data breach page. So they keep a database and this is 14 out of the 18 this year that have been reported to the state. So as you can see, we've had at least one every month being reported to the state of New Hampshire of a breach occurring. So these happen a lot. Uh, and this is just New Hampshire, right? So that means that the people that reported this had customers in New Hampshire. If they didn't have customers in New Hampshire, they don't have to report to this. And you can click on it and it'll give you the letter that they had to send out to everybody. Uh, Massachusetts has this, California has it. I don't think Florida keeps a database of it, uh, but you know, we see it everywhere. These are actually kind of interesting to go in and read sometimes. And these aren't all necessarily application breaches. Um, they could be, you know, that somebody lost a laptop, something like that. But as we can see, it's a big concern. Uh, so pretty interesting to go out there and, and see that stuff a little bit. Where we want to start, if you're looking at doing secure, uh, you know, thinking about web application security and mobile, everybody do web only, mobile, mix of both. I mean, we get a lot of people that kind of do a mix of both. <clears throat> well, we have OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project. It's been around for quite a few years. And uh, it's basically got the OWASP top 10. Anybody heard of the OWASP top 10? All right, a couple of people. All right, well, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, those all live on the OWASP top 10, right? It's the top 10 most common risks. They come out with a new one every three years, and uh, it basically ranks the top 10 risks that we need to know about. And if you have to deal with things like PCI, HIPAA, or any of those other regulations slash compliance slash whatever they are, um, what they want to know is they want to know that developers, know what the OWASP top 10 are. You don't have to be experts in it, but that's kind of, they say it's not a standard, but it's kind of the standard. <laughs> it's kind of the unwritten standard that we have out there. And they have a top 10 for both web and mobile. And uh, here's the top 10 for web. And so we can see we've got injection, which covers SQL injection, um, covers LDAP injection, XML injection, uh, pretty much anything with the word injection behind it. Uh, the only one it doesn't cover that is actually an ejection is cross-site scripting, which is A7. Uh, broken authentication, XML external entities, logging. This is the latest list, by the way, so this was just updated. Uh, these are the three we're gonna talk about today. So don't worry, we're not gonna go through all 10 of these things. That would be no fun. Because uh, we wouldn't have time to you know, walk through and demo and, and really talk about them. So we're gonna talk about injection, we're gonna talk about cross-site scripting, and we're gonna talk about XXE, which is kind of a newer, it's new on the list this year. 
Um, so people aren't as up on it, because like I said, most people are sticking to, they know OWASP top 10, and so if it's not on there, they usually kind of sweep it under the rug. So we're gonna talk about that one uh, a little bit as we go through. So the first thing I wanna do is, is talk about injection. So I do training uh, for developers, I do training for QA groups, and I try to break down some of this stuff to be maybe, I don't know, too simplistic? <laughs> so bear with me if it seems a little too simplistic to what we're doing. I, I kind of break it down into would my wife ex understand this? And if she's like, yeah, I like that, then I'm like, oh good, this will work. Uh, so <laughs> we're gonna go through a very kind of non-technical example of what injection is, and then we're gonna break into SQL injection, uh, cross-site scripting, all those. So as we had on there, hit the wrong button there, right? Our basic definition, the ability to break out a data context and switch to a command context. So let's look at, uh, we don't care about terminology, let's look at what that might look like. So imagine if we had an example item order and we said, what type of sandwich and drink would you like? Right? I answer that with data. So I have this question and I'm going to have specific data, my variables, that I'm going to respond to. So I could say I got ham and I'm, you know, I want to eliminate. So if I were to put this into some fictitious parser that we create that says, hey, how do you parse that order? Right? I'm going to delimit my values that I put in. So I've got command text and I've got data. So you can see here, I put all these on there. We've got command text that's kind of broken up and we've got data inserted and we've got delimiters around that data. So we're saying, hey, look, this is data. Don't treat it as command. And if you think about SQL injection, right, that's the same thing we're doing. We're taking a SQL statement and we're putting in data to say, hey, I want to do something with this. And then we've got some sort of terminator at the end. Well, what happens if I change my order and I say instead, I would like ham, and I know my delimiter here, <laughs> which is my closing bracket, and your wallet, and then my drink is lemonade. And after my wallet, notice how I have a period on there as well, right? That was my terminator. Uh, so if we put this in terms of SQL injection, my two dashes, for SQL Server, or my pound symbol, or my SQL, or whichever service you're using. All right, so that changes my statement. So now, I've got please get me a ham and your wallet, sandwich and lemonade, but sandwich and lemonade are commented out. All right, I kind of said, hey, I terminated this statement, forget everything after this, but I want to change it, right? I've changed my data context so that ham is part of my data and then and your wallet is part of my command. So now, hopefully you're gonna hand over a piece of ham <laughs> and your wallet. Uh, and so that's what we're doing when we talk about injecting, right? Is I'm gonna inject in and I'm gonna say, look, you think this is data, I wanna stop that, and I want you to think this is part of the command you're supposed to run. And this may make a little bit more sense when we look at the SQL example, uh, when we actually get into the code piece, but that's what we're trying to do, is we're trying to break out of that context. And that's important to remember because every piece of injection that we talk about works pretty much the same way. Right? SQL commands, I'm trying to break out of the apostrophe. Cross-site scripting, I'm trying to break out of your double quotes, I'm trying to break out of your single quotes, whatever you're wrapping your attributes in, I'm trying to break out so I can start inserting my own commands, I'm out of the data context. So the injection defenses that we typically have input validation, and output encoding, or escaping, depending on what type of system you're going to. And these transfer over into everything that we do. Anything injection related, we can apply this to. So input validation is just making sure that the input matches what you're expecting. It doesn't mean that not any piece of bad input might get through. So I mean, I always tell people, focus on the type of data you're bringing in, the range of data coming in, right, the length, the size, focus on that. Don't try to block out every piece of SQL injection coming through or every piece of cross-site scripting or every piece of XML that might be coming in. You're never gonna be able to stop all of it. This, we're just trying to limit down and say, hey, I know that I have an account number that is two characters, a dash, and, and five digits. So let's make sure that it matches that. We're limiting that down. And then we're going to switch over and use output encoding on the other side. And the reason for that is I don't know where my data is going when it comes up. How many people know every place that that first name field goes when you receive it from the profile page? You're going to take it and stick it in a database, but where does it go? Does it go to reporting? Does it go out to 
other pages? Does it get displayed on the top of every page? Like, where are we putting that data? I don't know where it is. So from a cross-site scripting example, I don't know what type of encoding I need to put when I'm taking it in. I don't even know where it's going to go. It might never even be put back out onto my site. So I don't have to do anything with cross-site scripting. So we look at the encoding. So the encoding is going to happen on the back side where we say we're preparing the item to be handled properly by the receiving system. So whether it's SQL where we're doing parameterized queries, whether it's XML where we're doing output encoding, um, or uh, HTML, right, where we're doing the output encoding for cross-site scripting. Whether it's LDAP and you're doing LDAP queries, right, making sure that you know what characters are control characters and can I make sure I escape those properly before I send them over to that system. And so I use this example. Uh, I'm trying to redo it, but this is kind of as good as I can come up with. I'm not too creative. But think about you have a cardboard box, right? You're shipping some things. It, it, it takes anything that fits in the box, right? Well, what happens when you want to put liquid in the box? I can't just pour my drink in the box. I have to do something to that. I have to prepare that to be able to go into my box, or it's going to leak out and it's going to cause problems. Well, for that, well, maybe we'll put it in a little Ziploc bag or something. <laughs> Don't you love the noun project? That's where I get my cool little images from. Uh, you know, we put it in a Ziploc bag, we've contained it, we've encoded it, we've prepared it for the receiving system. Now that might change if we changed what our receiving system was. Maybe we're not going to a box, maybe we're going to something else. I might not be able to put it in that. But that's what we're doing when we do this. Think about something like fragile items. I can't just throw my wine glasses into my box and hope that it makes it there okay. All right, we've got to wrap it in a little bubble wrap to make sure we prepare it so that way it's not getting broken or anything like that during transit. So that's what we're trying to do with that encoding. It's saying, look, we know there's this risk over here. There's a way we need to pack stuff. We need to make sure we do that. And so here's our example again, but this time we're using encoding. So for us and anybody that's done really old school SQL, um, I mean, I started out doing VB6, so we didn't have parameterized queries in the ASP classic. Uh, so what we did was we escaped our single quotes with a double single quote. Right, so if you had a single quote, you put one on the front of it, and it says, oh, you're good. Right, just the same thing we do with the slash on everything else and JavaScript and all that. So here, I made up the fact that if we double it, it won't be uh, treated that way. So when we do it, we get, please get me a ham, but it puts the double brackets there, and it tells the parser, it says, no, no, don't go back into a command context. I'm actually asking for a ham bracket bracket and your wallet sandwich, not a ham sandwich and your wallet. Right, and so that's what that encoding is doing. So I'm not going to let you break out, and then it's still going to let me do the lemonade because it doesn't switch out. Right, so now that whole value is my parameter, not just ham is my parameter, and I've modified the values. So let's take a look at how this works with SQL injection. So everybody pretty much raised their hand, said, you know, we know what SQL injection is. Right, so shouldn't have to cover too much on that. Uh, but really, it is, it's just our ability to manipulate the SQL query to do stuff you didn't want it to do or you didn't expect it to do. So some of the risk we have, right, we can certainly lose data. Um, anybody ever actually exploited SQL injection? Or just, you know, do the little comma or the, the apostrophe and you see the error message pop up? I mean, well, there's a lot we can do with it. And that's one of the things I wanted to point out was that we can actually do a lot with SQL injection. So we can steal the data. You know, obviously our databases are way in behind firewalls and all that stuff. I can't just access your database unless you're a MongoDB person. You leave it hanging out on the internet uh, with no credentials on it. But nobody in here would do that, right? And I don't know. I'm not sure I feel confident with that. Uh, authentication bypass. Uh, this isn't as bad anymore, but we used to have this on login screens. You know, you do the whole or one equals one, and next thing you know, you're logged in as the admin. Classic example. We love that one. Remote code execution, uh, the TJ Maxx. Anybody remember? Half of you don't even look old enough to remember. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem when you start getting old. Uh, TJ Maxx, you know, huge breach. I mean, that was years ago. God, I, don't even, I don't even want to guess how long it was ago. Uh, huge breach, but it started with SQL injection. And they were able to use SQL injection to plant credit card sniffing software onto their internal servers so they could grab all those credit card numbers. Uh, and do that. So we can actually do remote code execution using SQL injection, uh, which is really cool. I mean, you can actually uh, add, like, on a, if you're on a Windows machine and you're running with 
DBA type privileges. I mean, who here runs with SA, no password? Good, no, oh, I knew somebody was gonna. <laughs> uh, you know, stuff like that, like you're running with that and you're actually running that database with high privileges, I can actually add my own users to that Windows box all through SQL. Right, everybody, nobody, nobody re-enabled XP command shell, right? Well, that's okay, because I can enable it myself if I'm an admin. So even if you disable it, I can put it back, right? There's so much you can do if I can control the queries. Um, it's funny, when I was a developer, I, you know, I never thought of any of this. I can tell you I wrote many of applications with SQL injection in it. Uh, the real only reason we didn't have SQL injection in a lot of spots was because somebody would put a stupid apostrophe in and it would throw an error message. And we're like, oh crap, so we have to go fix it. Uh, it certainly wasn't because we were afraid somebody's going to steal our data. My view is that has changed a lot on that. So a real quick example, here's our select star from tables, and we're concatenating our strings, right? Never a good idea. Uh, here's the, the, the data we're passing in. So at least we're hashing our passwords. Everybody hashes their passwords, right? Bcrypt or PPKDF too? Hopefully. Anybody using MD5? Plain text? Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> And then when we put it in there, right, here we are. We've got our delimiters, specify, admin, our password, right? Those are data in our initial example, and everything else is the command. Well, what happens if I change it and I say, look, part of my pass in here is admin with a single quote or one equals one. And everybody loves the one equals one example. Well, you can see I've got admin and it closes out admin with my single quote and then or one equals one, and then I do the dash dash on SQL because it comments out the rest of the thing. And now I'm pulling back where the username is admin or basically just give me every row in the database. And usually the first row in the database is the admin because you always add the admin first so they can add all the rest of the people. Um, so very simple to do this. And I, didn't, I took the slide out that talks about <laughs> uh, the one equals one thing. Uh, I can't tell you how many places I've found SQL injection and I give them an example in a report and they come back and they fix it, like, all right, we fixed it. And you try it, and you're like, yeah, one equals one didn't work, but two equals two did. Uh, they think one equals one is some, like, special <laughs> keyword in, <laughs> they, don't, they don't really get it, right? And then they're like, oh, well, I solved it. No number will equal any number. And I was like, all right, great, A equals A. And they're like, ah! Right, like, just parameterize your query. I don't understand. But you'd be, so, I mean, a lot of people try to beat it that way, right? They'll look at the payload you put in, they're like, I'll just stop that payload. Uh, yeah, I can do anything that's true. I can actually just put the word true. Uh, but just for some reason, we like one equals one. Uh, so some best practices, and uh, fortunately, this isn't my training class, so I took out all the slides that go in depth on each one of these. Uh, <laughs> but basically, you know, using least privilege. Uh, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, I just started another test recently, and they had SQL injection. And not only do they have SQL injection, they're running their SQL server user as a database admin. So they didn't reduce the privileges of the user they're running as. Uh, it's an admin. So if I find SQL injection, I can do anything I want on that box. Uh, versus if I had limited down and said, hey, you only have access to these tables, or you only have access to these views, whatever it may be. Uh, you know, adding your input validation, but again, you're not going to block all SQL injection. You can put in your look for one equals one, but we're going to get around that. Uh, using parameterized queries. Um, fortunately, a lot, of, you know, a lot of the newer frameworks, I mean, who even actually writes their SQL statements anymore, right? Everybody's using ORMs. Um, you know, ORMs are usually pretty good unless you go out of the bounds of how you're supposed to use them, right? If you use them the way they're meant to be, they work. If you go create your own query, they don't work. Uh, same thing with store procedures. Does anybody use store procedures anymore? Oh, okay, a couple. For the longest time, people used to say store procedures weren't vulnerable because you have to pass parameters into a store procedure. Well, that's not true because in your store procedure, you can write inline SQL and you can still be vulnerable. Um, so it's just a matter of making sure that you don't have any type of concatenation that you're actually parameterizing it right and it's actually doing that encoding for you when we do that parameterization. All right, so let's look at the demo. Let's see if this works. Hmm. All right, here we go. Oh, we're coming up now. All right, so I've got this great little app. I know you guys are going to love this. And... Uh, let me go log out. So on this login screen, I'm going to type test. And, oh, no, I don't want to type test. That's the actual username. I'm going to put a single quote in. I'm going to type whatever password, because I honestly don't care what the password is. And notice that I get the generic 
SQL's syntax error, right? This is the key indicator. When I see this during a test, I do a happy dance because um, I'm like, yes, this is all good. Now, that's great. I got an error message, but it doesn't do me much, right? I mean, whoop de doo I saw a stupid error message. But what we're going to do is so I'm going to walk you through. We're going to look at a tool called SQL Map. Anybody heard of SQL Map? Well, just like you guys have great IDEs and, and fancy tools to do all your development, there have been kind people to build us fancy tools to take care of this. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go back here for a second. I'm going to open up my developer tools. And I'm going to look at network. And I'm going to redo that one. And it doesn't have to be anything special. I just need to capture this request. I'm going to do login. And so if I look at my parameters, sorry if this is a little small, but basically what we're looking at is right here. I just want to see the parameters I'm passing in, because when I set up SQL map, I have to know those. And then I drop the command line. Now SQL map, oh my goodness. Let's see if I can make this bigger. I did, but it's gone now. Oh, there it is. Can you see that? Do I need to make it a little bigger? I wonder if I can. Uh, my window's going to get too big. All right, well, let's try that. All right, so SQL Map is a free tool. You can download it. Easy to install. You just unzip it. Uh, it's written in Python. So what we're going to do is the first thing I want to do is look at the help. Now, the help is great on this thing. It actually provides us a ton of information of all the different things that we can do. So I could actually just type into the tool. I've got to pass the URL and everything. But I could do a dash A, and I'll just retrieve everything from the database. Uh, makes it really easy. Um, I could do dash dash current user. We'll look at that one. It'll tell me wh who's using the database. So when the application connects, who's it connect at? Is that user um, an admin, which is, I think, further down? Uh, I could pull out and try to enumerate the password hashes in the database. I can pull out all the tables, all the columns. Um, I can get the schema. I can dump the table data. Um, and then we can even, on certain systems, if they'll let you do it, you can actually create an open shell straight into the database. Uh, and then you can run commands directly to it. We're not going to do that because this is my main machine. So we don't do anything that actually really affects my computer. <laughs> Just trying to play it safe here. So what we're going to do, let me go up here. I'm going to change this. I'm going to specify my URL. I can't. It, my fingers are frozen. <laughs> Blog.local slash login.php. And then I need to specify those data parameters that we passed up. So we need to do data, oops, do my dash s. My data equals, and we had login equals login, and password equals test, and username equals, I'm going to put John in there. That sounds fun. It doesn't really matter what I put in there. I don't have to try to put a hack in here. I just need to put these values in. It's going to actually determine if there's SQL injection on this or not. And then I hit Enter. It starts going through. Now, I already ran this, so it's actually going to run a lot faster. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that it actually was going to run. So it'll actually it tests the connection to the target. It goes through, and it determines. It'll check every one of those posts, or those, those parameters, and determine if they're vulnerable. And it'll actually come back and let us know that username parameter is vulnerable, uh, both Boolean based blind, so I don't even need an error message that it can tell me. Um, and you know we got error based, so we know there's an error coming back. So we know we've got a vulnerable parameter. This is where it gets really easy. So now I just hit up again, because <laughs> we start with the same thing now that it's already found it. And now I can, oh, go up twice. Now I can say I want something. So maybe I want to find out current user. So I just type in current user. Again, it goes back through. Now it's sending a lot of stuff back and forth. This is chatty. So if you don't see this, <laughs> your logging's not that good in your app, because uh, you should see this happening. So we can see here that my current user is demo blog at localhost. So that's how I'm logged in as. I mean, that's fun to see what, we, what our current user is, but I want to see the data, right? That's what I want. So I just do dash dash dbs. 
and I hit it. Now, I actually did this on a client one time, and uh, their only defense was their performance. It was so bad. It took all night for Rose to fill on this thing, because it sits there and comes across real slow, these things. It was ridiculous. I was like, come on, I mean, like, like your only defense is your actual slowness at bad performance. Um, so <laughs> it was, I mean, it, it took like two or three days to enumerate the data I wanted to get to, and I didn't even touch a tenth of the data they had. So here we can see it's available databases. I got a CP tracker, demo, MySQL. So now that I know that, I say, oh, okay, well, I want to go into my uh, demo database. So I'll change my dash DBS to a dash D so I can specify demo. And then I'll say, okay, well, what tables exist? Because I don't know what I'm looking for if I don't know what tables are out there. So I specify which tables I want. It'll go through, figures out through some magic wizardry what tables exist out there. And uh, boom, I got a blog table, blog post, comment, feedback, blog. Oh, user table sounds good, right? So all right, well, let me hit up again because this is difficult. Uh, I'll go back, I'll do dash T, and I'll do the user table. And maybe I just want to see it first, what, what columns exist. So now I can drill into that user table. It'll go back and enumerate and see what columns are there. So I want to be able to see, like, I mean, do you have passwords in this table? Because that's interesting to me. So I don't want to go dump the table yet if I don't know that. So here we go. Here's all the columns. I can tell you the types of every column. We have a username. Ooh, we do have a password. So all these credential breaches you see all the time. This is probably how most of it's done. So now we can go back and actually say, you know what? I just want to do a dump. And it'll run through. Now, I actually did this. I, I was working with a client. We found SQL injection. They were hosted on a major hosting provider. Like, they have a lot of people on them. I ran my SQL injection. I ran my SQL map. And uh, so you can see, I get back their ID, their role. Fortunately, I'm decrypting my password, so I'm kind of safe here. But I get all the data from that table. <laughs> but it's that, it literally is pretty much that quick, um, except for that one client. Uh, so when I was testing that one client, that other client, <laughs> I ran this, I dumped a bunch of their data down to my system, be able to say, hey, I got all your stuff. And then I was running another tool a little bit later, and all of a sudden I got blocked. Like I couldn't access their site anymore. I'm like, what the heck? They saw me doing this. It just took them too long to block me. Um, so just to tell you the share speed of what we can do this, I mean, obviously I'm doing it waiting. Uh, I mean, I had all their data before they caught me and blocked me. I had already downloaded everything I needed. So, you know, this is just an example of, you know, when we talk about things like SQL injection, yeah, we see the error message, but I mean, we have tools that make this, I mean, my eight year old could do this. And I mean, I find this, I'm done. And it was actually really timely that right before we were doing this, I started a new client and they had SQL injection. And I came to the Jack's Node meetup. And then that night at 1130, I spent like 30 minutes using this and, and grabbing a bunch of their data to be able to let them know that they had this problem. So it was just, it was lucky for me. <laughs> Anytime a security guy tells you it's good, it's usually good for them, not, not for you. Um, so, and like I said, you know, there's a bunch of other commands that we could run here. Uh, so it makes it really kind of interesting. So let's, uh, oh, I don't need to escape out. This is actually live. Uh, so we don't need to do anything more with that. I want to make sure I get time to do all the demos. Who, I mean, people understand what cross-site scripting is? I can do a couple slides with it. I just want to make sure we do the demo of it. It's way more fun. Uh, oop, no, not that one. All right, well, let's just hit a couple of these. I'll just go through these real quick. Uh, so cross-site scripting, same thing, right? I can inject my own stuff into your stuff. Uh, in it, but it's the client side, right, not the server side. I'm going to run it in the browser. I'm going to run it in the context of the browser. Uh, so I can rewrite your page contents. I can redirect you to a malicious site. I always love that one, because uh, then I'll make a site that looks exactly like your login page. And uh, people will type it in. They give me their passwords. I can steal session cookies if you don't have those protected. So I can hijack your session. Uh, and we can do remote code execution. Uh, with the right conditions on a machine, uh, through cross-site scripting, I can actually gain full control onto your system. Um, and that helps me bypass all your firewalls and you know the $100 million worth of equipment you have protecting your perimeter. We bypass it with cross-site scripting. Uh, so there's three types, reflected. Persistent and DOM. And so let's look at each one of these real quick. Reflected, basically it's up on the URL. You take it and you just spit it back out on the screen. So 
So I passed in my own script tags, and you said, sure, I'll take those and embed them into my page. And of course, when it runs, it'll pop up an alert box, right? Because we got something like this, response.write you searched for, and then you're just taking that raw value and sending it out. And so here we can see that it actually gets output as a script tag, right? The browser doesn't know you didn't mean to do that, so it allows us to go through. Then we have persistent, and we're gonna look at persistent and reflected here in our quick demo. Uh, persistence, where we're actually gonna store it like in the back end. So I'm gonna upload it, think of a forum or a blog, like my stupid example. Uh, I'm gonna upload it, I'm gonna wait for people to come along and view that page, and then it's gonna download it and let it go. And then you have DOM-based, uh, which is sort of similar to reflected, but basically I'm expecting the DOM to do it. So anybody that's ever written any code that you know, is going and taking like parts of the URL and embedding it into their JavaScript, right? So I'm not reflecting it directly down onto the page. I'm using something like a document.location.href.indexof and grabbing parts and then doing like a document.write or something, right? So it, it's letting the DOM execute it when it does that. So simple recommendations, input validation. We love saying input validation. My thing, output encoding is the way you're gonna fix it because you're not gonna stop every type of thing I might try to pass up. But if we do output encoding, they can make sure that you know, the angle brackets or the alligators, or whatever you wanna call them, don't come back out as those, right? We change those and we'll look at what that looks like. You can also do response headers, which help, but they're browser based, so they may not work the same in all browsers. Anybody use content security policy? A content security policy works really well um, for helping limit down cross-site scripting. Uh, especially the example we're about to walk through. All right, so let's load this up. All right, so let me get back into my little app here. I don't need this anymore. I'll go back, I'll log in like a good person. All right, go to my blog page, and I'm gonna do a new post. And so we'll do the exact sample that we just saw. I'm gonna name it XSS. Oops. And I'll just put a script tag in there. I don't know why sometimes I feel like this is a touch screen. It's not. Uh, <laughs> like I'll go to touch, like, let me move to that box. Uh, test. All right, so we've posted it. And notice when I go to my page, it pops up a box. Whoever here has had a pen test done on their application and they've found cross-site scripting, this is what you see in the report. They always do a pop-up box, real <laughs> sexy. It's good stuff. But let's do something, we're gonna do something a little bit better than that. Um, but let's go ahead and view the source real quick. Um, and I'll just show you down here that the script alert did come out as script alert, right? So it didn't do any type of encoding that we would want it to do. All right, let me do a new post. And this time, I'm gonna do XSS beef. Anybody heard of beef? Browser exploitation framework. Yeah, this is really fun too. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add my own script tag. And I am at 172.16.128.129, I think. Let's see, I got my little test thing up here. Let's see, 172.16.128.129, one, that's what I said, right? 16.128.129, yeah. That sounds good. Oops. Port 3000. Hook.js. All right, so this time I'm going to embed my own script in here. And when I embed my own script, it's putting a hook in there. Test again. All right, now I hope I did. You guys double checked me on that, right? I mean, I had the right IP address. We're going to find out in a real quick second. Uh, all right. So I got my alert. Let me go back over here and let's see if I got a zombie. Now if I did it right, I should see it pop up over here. I mean, I have no doubt that I could have screwed up the thing because I did it three times before this and I, I screwed up the IP address each time. <laughs> That's how good I am with it. All right, let's make sure. See, this is the live demo thing. It's always dangerous. All right, now we're reload the page. Ah, oh, yeah, I found it that time. 
All right, I don't want this anymore. Let me go back over here to my UI. All right, so now I've got my online browser. I can click on it. My page is hooked. My victim is, is hooked. I can see all kinds of info. They give me all kinds of browser information, whether you've got VB scripts, whether you've got PhoneGap, WebSockets, uh, if you've got ActiveX, whether you've got Flash, all that stuff. And those things are important because Flash is always vulnerable. So if you've got Flash, game over. But the other thing that's cool, so I can come over here to commands and I actually say, listen, I want to send a command to that browser. So I've got all these commands over here that I can send. And uh, so the first one I want to send is I'm going to create an alert box just to show that we can do it. I hit execute and I get my alert box, right? Like I own this page right now. As long as you stay on it, I can do what I want. The other cool thing we can do with it, I always like this one, it's down social engineering, is it's called pretty theft. Anybody use Facebook? Who doesn't, right? I don't, but most people usually do, right? Uh, so you can actually do pretty theft, and you come over here, you can say, let's see, I wanna, what credentials do you want? You want Facebook, you want LinkedIn, you want Windows, whatever you want. Maybe I know it's some place that's doing Windows, you know, there are, it's a Windows shop. So I'm gonna select Windows, and I'll say execute. And then when I come over here, my page is overlaid as though my Windows now needs me to log in again. And when I go type in James and password, I click OK, and when I re-click on this command, hopefully you can see it, but there's my James and there's my password, right? So something simple like a cross-site scripting flaw, like if I can hook something like this, then it's very easy for me to then start running commands against your browser. Not everything pops up something, right? I don't have to pop stuff up. I mean, there's commands in here to grab your webcam, um, all kinds of stuff, right? So, we have really cool tools that people have built for us to be able to do some of these. Uh, now, the last thing I wanted to talk about, because we are running out of time, uh, and I'll just do real quick on the slides so you can see them. Slideshow. Uh, is XXE. This is kind of newer. And uh, basically, it's taking advantage of your XML parser. So if you take XML up and you parse it and you do something with it, um, there's a chance you might have a problem. Google had this problem in 2014, I think. They had the way you could configure your own toolbar button, I guess in the browser. Uh, you could configure your own buttons and you uploaded XML. Well, some researchers found out that you could upload XML that would give back documents from the server by using XXE. And we'll take a look at how that works in just a moment. Um, so we can disclose data. We can do denial of service. That's kind of cool. So if your parser is not configured right, I can actually pretty much bring a halt to your system um, or potentially remote code execution. Here's kind of how it looks like. You got your regular XML document. We're adding in our own entity. And with our entity, we're saying, hey, I want a system entity and I want to grab a file. And I want to take that file and I want to replace it here with this placeholder. All right? I'm not a huge XML person, so I apologize if I don't have all the right terminology. Uh, but that's what we're doing, right? We're going to replace ampersand win with testdata2.txt. So very simple. Um, and looking at a denial of service, basically, we just keep embedding these things. So I create my first entity, then I create another entity that references that entity a few times, then I create another one that references that one. So I only need five or six of these, and it'll actually cause your XML parser just to throw up. Uh, it won't know how to because it's just so embedded with each other. So we can do a denial of service with it as well. So let's look at the demo. I mean, it takes so long to switch between these things. All right, good. Now what I have is the ability, now you can see the posts I have, uh, XSS beef and XSS. Now what I want to do is I'm going to import posts. Because I mean, you know, people import posts. I mean, you know, switch blogs. I want to move from Blogger to WordPress, whatever. I'm going to select my file, and I'm going to pick my bad2.xml, which, I don't know, I thought I had here someplace. Everything's so tiny in here now. <laughs> like, I can't see anything. I thought I had bad2 open. I guess I do not. Uh, but basically what it's doing is it's going to grab the, uh, the Etsy password file on my system. So it looked just like what we just saw on this screen, 
Everybody can still see that? Except for instead of saying file C users admin, it's just going to say Etsy slash password. Because uh, I'm on a Linux based machine, the Etsy password is always the first one we go for. Because it's got all kinds of great information in it. So I grab my file, I add my post. My post edition was successful. I go back to my blog, my XSS is still there. And now notice my test from XML here actually just embedded my entire Etsy password file in here. Now fortunately Etsy password files don't contain passwords anymore, but it does list out every account or service that's listing on my system. Um, so very popular to try this. So basically what we would do is we run this and see, yes, we can actually do this. And then we start, like I could pull your config files, I could pull you know, any of the application files if I wanted to. So you know, if you've got a web config.xml or you've got something like that, right? The server won't pass that up, but XXE will, right? And it'll grab that file. As long as the application has access to that file, permissions to it, then we can grab that file and send it through. Now what we're expecting to happen I got my, uh, my good XML file here. And if we look at that, that's the one thing that stinks about those, right? Test from XML is basically just a simple hide there post, right? I just imported a post and it worked great. Uh, so really easy to see how that works. So real quickly, I just wanna show you how some of that code looks. So in the SQL injection example, we can see here we had the issue of we're just concatenating our code, right? Never a good idea to fix it. Instead, we would do something like this where we have that parameterized value. I'm going to stick a token in there. I'm going to add my parameters. And then when the system does it, just like our ORMs do it, it'll auto encode that for us and we won't have the problem. If we look at... Uh, the blog page when we talk about the X, X, uh, cross site scripting, right here, our body tag is where our problem was, right? So if I'm just outputting straight from SQL, and uh, you know, a lot of people think we trust SQL, we don't. Uh, don't trust your database because you don't know who's putting data into it. I get a lot of people think, oh, it's my database, you know, and obviously nobody puts something in there. You know, how many people have a mobile app talking to that same database? I worked at a company, we had a mobile app and a web app. The web app guy was great at input validation, the mobile app did not care. And uh, so you could get cross-site scripting in through the mobile app and out through the web app. Um, so you know, and if you don't have a mobile app today, you might have one tomorrow, right? So that's why we don't want to trust our database. So instead of that, like here, as a PHP example, right, we do HTML entities. Um, you know, if you're .NET, there's encoding methods that are available to do this as well. Every language has encoding methods. If you're using newer stuff like Angular, React, all those, a lot of those actually do this for you, um, unless you kind of go raw. Um, so if you guys use Razor or anything like that, Razor auto-encodes your output, unless you do like HTML raw. <laughs> then it does not auto-encode your output. And then you run into this type of problem. And then if we look at the XXE, um, import post, this one I actually, this is actually secure by default. I had to change it. Um, but what we're doing is we're just manipulating the parser. So when I come down here and I say load XML, I'm actually going in and saying like whether I want to allow external entities um, or DDD load, right? But by default, I actually am not vulnerable. So you can see down here when I'm not vulnerable, all I do is say load XML in the XML file, but to make my demo work. I actually had to purposely do this, but don't be surprised, people purposely do this. So <laughs> um, I actually did a real big write-up. Um, OWASP, if you go out to their website and look up XXE for .NET, most of their stuff comes from my blog uh, for which versions are safe by default, which are not, which objects. So whether you use an XML text reader versus XML document versus XML XPath document, whatever it is, um, I looked at all those and uh, wrote up like what versions are vulnerable by default, which ones are not vulnerable by default. Um, so that way you know, because that's where it gets a little bit tricky in there. So, and then there was one other uh, thing I wanted to show you with the cross-site scripting. 
Uh, let me just open up the app, because there's one other spot where we actually have it, and it's kind of an interesting thing. So if I go to new post, notice there's a back button here. And so that back button is actually taking, and I can't make this any bigger, but um, this return URL from the URL. Now this actually came from a test I did. I just transformed it, it was a .NET app. It's, but it's just taking that URL and it's embedding it in the page, reflected cross-site scripting. So we can change this URL and, you know, I could do something. Now this is, I could do where I say, yeah, you know what, I want the URL to be test. And then I already know it's a, a double quote. We'll see that in a second. Space. So I'm out of the href, right? Because I just did my double quote up there. Sorry, you can't see it. I'm out of the href. And then I can say on click, alert nine. I always like alert nine. It's easy. Uh, and then I'm going to leave off that trailing double quote, right? So now I'm going to modify what this page looks like. And amazingly enough here, let's look at the source first. I'll blow it up because every time I do this, it shrinks it. Right here is our source, if you can see it. But notice now that my link, href test, and I added my own attribute. And the reason I did the double quote is because our attributes are wrapped in double quotes, right? So I want to break out of this. That's my goal as an attacker. I want to get out of the double quote so I can write my own on-click event. And then I left off that trailing double quote because it would have been right at the end here, right? So now that I did that, if I click the back button, it'll execute my code. Now we can go through and we can try to fix that, right? And we can say, oh, well, I don't want to allow double quotes. So I'll encode double quotes and it'll just keep double quotes inside there. Hrefs are interesting. What is this thing? What have I done here? I don't even know what that page is. What the? I guess apparently a page that I had on there. Now, one thing I can do, this is, so this is interesting. I wanted to just talk about this, is like hrefs for links. Um, so the A tag. Uh, iframes, that type of stuff, the source tag, those I can actually just do JavaScript directly in them. I don't have to put a link in there. So instead what I can do, because say I can't break out, you've encoded your double quotes, you've done a great job, I can actually just change it to um, JavaScript. So here, instead of putting a URL, I'm putting a JavaScript URL, which is just JavaScript colon, and then whatever JavaScript I want to run after that. And so when I do that, as we saw, ah, I hate how this thing doesn't say. We can see right here, my back button now looks like this. And amazingly, when I click that link, it'll execute that JavaScript. It's the little things that make us excited. And so we click it, obviously it executes that JavaScript again. Um, just like that, right? Because we can do that in those. And that's one of those things, another spot where sometimes people overlook the simple solution is they go and apply the wrong encoding. Like here we want URL encoding versus HTML encoding because we're in a URL and there's a difference. So URL encoding would actually encode that colon and stop the JavaScript prefix from working. Uh, so let me just change, and that way we can look at this. Let me change my app so it's no longer vulnerable. Doesn't everybody wish they had a simple switch like this? <laughs> and we'll go back to the blogs page. Now notice this time we didn't get our alert box, right? No alert nine, nothing like that. As a matter of fact, if we look at this cross-site scripting, it now shows the alert, like the message I put in there, right? It shows my script tag for I tried to put that hook JS in there because the difference there is, when we come to, oh, I went too far, I think. Yeah, so we can see, notice now, I don't know if you can see it over here, but instead of having less than and greater than, right, we got the HTML entities there of those values, telling the browser display a less than symbol or a greater than symbol, don't treat it as my delimiter. So now it'll just display it on the screen. The browser won't actually look at it and say, oh, here's a script tag. Let me run this. 
right? So very simple change that fixed that. And if you remember when we looked at blog, right, we just added this HTML entities call around it. And that said, OK, any less than, change it to ampersand LT. Any greater than, ampersand GT. But if we go back to our page, let me get rid of this. It doesn't execute here. Well, unfortunately, I didn't make that fix on my actual blog page or the blog post page. So it's still there, right? So I've got vulnerable code in my database. And to me, that's not that big of a deal, right? The fix here is when you output that code, we need to make sure that we're properly encoding that data every place we do it. Because on this blog page, maybe it makes sense that it's HTML encoding. On the post page, maybe we needed URL encoding, right, in those different areas. Uh, so those are things we want to think about as we're going through these apps, uh, trying to protect against this. And this is pretty much, I mean, like when I'm testing, this is what I'm doing. Like I'm finding inputs and I'm putting different values in there to see if we can cause this stuff to happen uh, to get it out there. So let me just uh, play from current slide. One thing I wanted to mention, if you like this stuff, if you're interested in learning more about it uh, and you want a more current app, uh, there's a thing called the Juice Shop, OWASP Juice Shop. I actually have, if you go uh, onto YouTube and just type develop sec, um, you'll find my channel and I actually have videos talking about how to set this up. Uh, but it's basically a purposely vulnerable app. So you can come in, you can play with it. It's written in Angular and Node. And you can do cross-site scripting, you can do SQL injection. Um, it's basically a capture the flag. So it's got all kinds of stuff. Uh, if you find the scoreboard page, it'll tell you all the things to look for. And you can go through and try to figure out how to do them. I don't like using this as my demo because then it takes away from you getting to do it if you want to do it. Uh, but just do a search for OWASP Juice Shop. Uh, really kind of cool way to, to get in there and, and play around with it if you have an interest in just learning more about how some of this stuff comes across. And other than that, uh, that's it. Thanks for showing up. I appreciate it. <laughs>